Hello fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I'm so happy that you decided to spend this time with me in the scriptures today. The purpose of this channel is to help you teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. And this week, the Come Follow Me manual instructs us to study Exodus chapters 35 through 40 and Leviticus chapters 1, 16, and 19. However, I'm not going to really follow that scripture block assignment. I'll admit that I'm a little baffled by the decision to focus on Exodus chapters 35 through 40 as the material to study about the construction of the ancient tabernacle. In my opinion, it's Exodus chapters 25 through 30 that contain a superior treatment of the topic. Those chapters contain the Lord's initial tabernacle construction instructions whereas 35 through 40 describe the actual building of the materials. So forgive me for being a bit of a rebel here, but I'm going to focus my attention on those chapters instead. And also with Leviticus, I still encourage you to read those particular three chapters for your study. But I'm going to take a broader approach to studying that book. So with that in mind, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And for an icebreaker, have your students either share their answer to the following question with a partner or with the class. Which of the following buildings is the temple most like to you and why? And you've got pictures here of a school, a courthouse, a church, a hospital, a home, or a castle. Now, of course, there's no right or wrong answers here can just allow your students to share their thoughts and insights, because I can see aspects of each of those types of buildings reflected in the purposes and power of the temple. But today, I'd like to focus on one of those particular aspects of temple worship, and that is the temple as a school. The temple is a house of learning. In fact, that's one of the titles that the Lord gives for the temple in the Doctrine and Covenants. God commanded the early saints to organize yourselves, prepare every needful thing, and establish a house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. Well, today we're going to be studying the instructions that the Lord gave to the ancient Israelites to build him a house. And since the children of Israel were still on their journey towards the promised land at this point, that temple needed to be portable. They would need to carry it with them. And that portable temple was called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle shares many similarities to our modern day temples and served many of the same purposes. So as we study the construction, the worship, and the history of the tabernacle, we're going to see what this inspired structure can teach us about mortality, the plan of salvation, and the life and mission of Jesus Christ. We'll study it as a house of learning. Now, there are certain things that we can't talk about in regard to modern-day temple worship. and We've made covenants not to reveal their sacred nature. But we can talk all we want about the symbolism of the tabernacle and not break any covenants. And this can act as great practice for interpreting the symbols of the temple because there are lots of similarities between temple worship then and temple worship now. It's going to help us. And President Spencer W. Kimball once said the following about the temple. The house of the Lord is functional. Every element in the design, decoration, atmosphere, and program of the temple contributes to its function, which is to teach. The temple teaches of Christ. It teaches of his ordinances. It is filled with his spirit. There is an aura of deity. This has always been true about the house of the Lord, whether it's our modern day temples or the ancient tabernacle. The Lord has always meant for us to learn from his holy house. To begin our study of the ancient tabernacle, let's examine three initial truths that its construction can teach us. So begin by counting off your students as ones, twos, and threes, and invite them to study and answer their assigned questions after they've read Exodus 25, verses 1 through 8. Now let's go through each of these questions together. 
Question number one. How were the materials used to build the tabernacle to be offered? Answer. Willingly. Moses didn't demand that the people offer the materials for the tabernacle. They were to offer them voluntarily. And why do you think that is? Well, because of a little gospel principle we refer to as agency. Agency is fundamental in God's plan. He doesn't force or demand sacrifice. It's all about agency and freedom. Because really, the meaning of a gift is greatly diminished when it's given grudgingly or out of a sense of obligation. I mean, how much would you appreciate a gift if you knew that the person giving it had been coerced, intimidated, or, or threatened to give it to you? See, God wants our will, not just empty compliance. Question number two, what kind of materials were used to build the tabernacle? Answer, let's see, gold, silver, fine linen, gemstones, spices. What do all of these things have in common? They're all valuable, precious, and rare. And what does that teach us about the sacrifices we make to the Lord? I believe that suggests that we should always offer the Lord our best. He doesn't want our leftovers, our damaged goods, our afterthought offerings. I mean, this is God we're talking about. And you don't give the ruler and creator of the universe anything less than your finest, right? When it comes to the way we serve in our callings, the way we live his gospel, or the nature of our material or immaterial offerings, they should all be the best we can give. Now, the, the amount and the quality of those sacrifices will vary from individual to individual, but they can all be our best. The widow at the time of Christ was only able to offer two small mites as a sacrifice, but it was all that she had. And to God, that meant more than all the grander offerings that were made that day. It's the attitude that matters most. And where did the children of Israel get all these materials? I mean, they'd been slaves, right? If you go back to Exodus 12, verses 33 to 36, you'll see how. They got them from Egypt. The Egyptians offered them these things to try to convince them to leave quicker. And you'll recall that Egypt represented the world. Interesting. It's almost as if God is saying... Okay, now that I've taken you out of the world, let me take the world out of you. And don't think for a minute that this is all about God wanting these precious materials for himself. This is not self-aggrandizement. I mean, what, what's God going to do with gold and silver? No, it's the Israelites that were going to use the tabernacle and worship in it and learn from it and be blessed by it. The same principle goes for us today. We are the ones that use the temple and benefit from it and learn from it. Its focus and purpose is to bless and help us. Question number three. What does 25.8 teach us about the purpose of the tabernacle? Answer. Its purpose is to allow God to dwell among us. And what does that teach us about God's character? Well, that he wants to dwell among us. That's one of my favorite truths taught here. If I were to ask you where God lives, how would you answer that question? Would you say he lives in heaven? Somewhere out there, up in the sky, deep in the farthest reaches of the universe? Maybe some other spiritual dimension apart from this world? No, where does God live? Well, in my area... He has an actual address. I would say that God lives at 1122 South and 4000 West in South Jordan. <laughs> now that's the address of the Ochre Mountain Temple. And not only does he live there, but he has numerous houses all over the world. The temple is the house of the Lord. But those houses, they're in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our nations. God dwells among us. For the ancient Israelites, the tabernacle was set right in the center of the camp. God's not removed from his people. He's not distant. 
He's not an absentee deity. He cares about the salvation and progress of his children, and he wants to be close to them. You'll notice the temples are often built on top of hills, near major freeways, or in locations where they can really stand out. Their architecture stands out. It's unique, awe-inspiring, radiant, all lit up at night. Those structures testify to the fact that God is with us. No wonder our church leaders want to build so many temples throughout the world. The more members of the church that live in a place where they can see the temple frequently, they're going to be reminded of that glorious truth. God is with us. Now let's talk about the elements of the tabernacle itself. It was made up of specific rooms and objects. And we're going to begin by doing a quick scripture marking activity. Let's divide up the different sections that describe the elements of the tabernacle and mark them in our scriptures. And at the same time, we're going to label the following handout that has a layout of the ancient tabernacle. Help you to visualize it. And, And when you're finished, you can place this page in your scriptures for future reference. And, and it's designed so that it'll fit within a regularly sized set of scriptures. So here we go. Exodus 25, 10 through 22 describes the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. 25, 23 through 30, the table of shoe bread. 25, 31 through 40, the candlestick or the menorah. Exodus chapter 26, the entire chapter, describes the actual construction of the tabernacle, the structure of the tent itself. Exodus 27, the altar of sacrifice. Exodus 30, verses 1 through 16, the altar of incense. And then Exodus 30, 17 through 21, the laver, or a type of wash basin. Now, we're not going to take the time to read the entire description of each of these objects and and how they were to be made. There's a lot of detail, and that would be somewhat tedious to cover in a class. But we want to at least know what the objects are and then ponder the possible symbolism of what they can teach us. If you'd like to give your students an even better visual understanding of what the ancient tabernacle looked like, you could show them the following video from YouTube that takes you on a virtual tour through a a life-size replica of the tabernacle. And I'll put a link to that here above and in the video description below. We're going to begin here by talking about the different areas within the tabernacle complex. There were three major areas or rooms. There was the outer courtyard, the holy place, and then the holy of holies. There was only one gate through which you could enter the tabernacle and therefore one direction of travel or progress through the rooms from east to west. Now, the most sacred room of all was the Holy of Holies, which represented heaven, the celestial kingdom, or the presence of God. Therefore, the purpose of temple worship was to teach the Israelites what was needed to return to God. There was a specific pathway back to him, a plan of salvation. And that's what the temple layout teaches us. The outer court represented the telestial kingdom or the world. The holy place represents progress toward a more terrestrial way of life and shows that it's possible to come out of the world and live closer to God, to live a more holy life in the holy place then there's a veil that separates us from the actual presence of God or the Holy of Holies. And the implied promise is that if we continue to live a holy lifestyle, eventually we'll be able to pass through the veil and enter the presence of God in a celestial glory. It's not a wall, it's not a barrier, but a veil. A veil can be passed through. And that's our goal or purpose in life, to return to him. Now, each of the pieces of furniture and sacred objects 
are placed in the tabernacle to teach what it takes for us to accomplish that goal. They teach us the principles and actions that will make it possible for us to be worthy to return to his presence. And this is where I like to give my students a chance to ponder the significance and symbolism of each object. And I like to give them some details or some hints about each one to help them to contemplate what they might represent. And as an example, I'll usually do the first one. So let's start with the altar of sacrifice. And this is where the Israelites would offer animal sacrifices to the Lord to show their devotion and willingness to follow him. The gospel principle this represents shouldn't be too hard for us to figure out. It represents sacrifice. In order to get closer to God and return to him, we've got to make sacrifices. We're going to have to give some things up in order to make progress. And what kinds of things? Our means, our time, our talents, our will, our sins, they must all be offered up to God. And also the altar of sacrifice can represent the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and his atonement. None of us is going to be able to return to the presence of God without that. It's the blood of the Lamb that justifies us and allows us to be forgiven of sin. The altar of sacrifice teaches us this. That principle will bring us closer to God. Now you try the rest on your own. And as a teacher, after your students have pondered the symbolism on their own, you could ask them what they came up with and discuss the symbolism of each object. You might also consider showing the following church-produced video that goes into the symbolism of each object and acts as a good companion video to the one that we showed earlier. I'll put a link above and in the video description below. But let's go through each of these together right now. The next object, the laver. What was the purpose of the labor? If you read chapter 30, verses 19 through 21, you'll see that it was filled with water and used by the priests to wash themselves before entering the tabernacle. Now, there's no indication that this labor was used for the purpose of performing baptisms or anything. But the idea is still the same. It was a place of cleansing. We've got to be washed clean of the dirt and stains of this world if we wish to enter the holy place, if we want to be holy. We can't return to God unclean because no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God. We've got to be purified and washed. Nowadays, repentance and baptism accomplish the same thing. But the labor teaches that principle. And that principle will bring us closer to God. Now, those two principles take us into the holy place. Sacrifice and repentance and the purification that comes through the cleansing power of blood and water will make us worthy to enter the holy place. But we need to be more than just forgiven of sin, more than just be justified. We've got to be sanctified. And the furniture found in the holy place is going to teach us how we can do that. So, the table of shewbread. Shewbread was unleavened bread. And if you remember our lesson on the Passover, you might recall that unleavened bread doesn't spoil. It lasts, and it represents the purity and the eternal nature of God's word and doctrine, and that it nourishes and sustains us through life. And also, although it's not mentioned here in the scriptures, Tradition states that there was also a pitcher of wine included on the table. So what, or even who, do you think the table of shoe bread could represent? Bread and wine? Does that remind you of something? Sounds like the sacrament, doesn't it? And who does the sacrament represent? The blood and body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ feeds and refreshes us with his gospel. He is the bread of life and the living water. We've got to be nourished by his gospel, his love, and his sacrifice if we wish to return to God's presence. The table of shewbread teaches us this. That principle will bring us closer to God. 
Next, the candlestick. We've all seen pictures or examples of the sacred Jewish candlestick, or the menorah. How many branches did it have? Look in verse 25, verse 37. Seven branches. And each branch was to be lit with a flame. What's the symbolism here? Well, what does light or fire usually represent in the gospel? The Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And then why seven? Well, the world was created in seven different time periods, and we have seven days in the week. What's the candlestick teaching us about the Spirit? How many days of the week do we need to have the Spirit with us? How often should we be guided and illuminated by it? every day. We need to always have His Spirit to be with us. Another thought? Perhaps it could be teaching us that the Spirit has many different ways of teaching us. Visions, dreams, thoughts, feelings, voices, experiences, or promptings. Communicates through various means. Candlestick teaches us this, and that principle will bring us closer to God. Now let's come back to the altar of incense in just a moment and talk about the Ark of the Covenant now. This was the most sacred object in all the temple. And most simply put, the Ark was a box. A very special box that contained some holy objects in it. What were those holy objects? Actually, there were three. And and you can discover what they were by reading Exodus 16, 33-34, Exodus 25, 21, and Numbers 17, 8. But if you want to make it a bit easier, you can see all three of them mentioned in one place by going to Hebrews 9, 4, which says, which had the golden censer, and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So it had a pot of manna, Aaron's rod, and the Ten Commandments. And why those three things? Well, do you remember what the manna symbolized? God's word or scripture. Then Aaron's rod was a symbol of his priesthood power. And it did something rather miraculous. When he placed his rod into the ground, it budded, blossomed, and grew almonds. Now what does that teach us about the priesthood? It's a living priesthood. It's the kind of priesthood that produces fruit and nourishment. And then the tablets represented God's laws. Those were the three sacred objects placed inside the ark. And then the lid of the ark was placed over them. And and that lid had a special name. What was it called according to Exodus 25, 22? It was called the mercy seat with its cherubim or angels depicted on it. And that was the place where the Lord would commune with the high priest or with Moses. So what does the ark represent, or who does the ark represent? God. And what quality is most associated with him and his character? And I love this. It wasn't called the judgment seat, or the wrath seat, or the intimidation seat, but the mercy seat. God is a God of mercy. But think about this for a moment. There's a lesson about God's mercy taught by the ark. It was an object lesson. Think about those three objects inside. How am I to interact with each of them in order to obtain God's mercy? What am I to do with God's laws and commandments? I keep them. I obey them. What do I do with God's living priesthood? I honor it. I use it to accomplish his work. What am I to do with his word, his bread from heaven. I partake of it daily. I nourish my spirit with it. So do you see the lesson? If I obey God's laws and honor his priesthood and partake of his word, then I will be covered by God's mercy. Cool, huh? The ark teaches us this. That principle will bring us closer to God. Now, the final piece of furniture we haven't discussed yet, the altar of incense. 
And what would they use that for according to chapter 30, verses 6 through 8? Incense was burned there at all times. And what was the incense a symbol for? Well, it was sweet smelling. The smoke of it would drift through the veil into the Holy of Holies as it ascended slowly from earth towards heaven. Do you have any guesses of what it could be? And check your answer by going to Revelation 8, 3 through 4. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So it's prayer, the prayers of the saints. Now remember that the holy place represents the kind of life God's saints live. The state before entering the holy of holies or the presence of God. But what's something that connects the two rooms? What was capable of floating or ascending through the veil? Our prayers. Our prayers connect us with heaven. And look at the placement of the altar of incense. Where is it in relation to the other three pieces of furniture within the tabernacle? Right in the middle. And who did we decide each of these pieces represented? God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. And what is it that unites us with all three? Prayer. We pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ through the means or the power of the Holy Ghost. The altar of incense teaches us this, and that principle will bring us closer to God. Now, if you take all of these principles together, you can get a pretty good idea of what's required to return to the presence of the Father. We must offer sacrifice and be cleansed by the blood and atonement of Jesus Christ, the altar of sacrifice, and be washed clean of our sins, the labor, and that will make us holy or justified, take us to the holy place. We will then need to take the Spirit as our daily guide, the menorah, relying on the gospel and love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the table of Shubrek, and pray daily the altar of incense. If we do these things, we'll be sanctified and eventually be brought through the veil back into the presence of God. And then the lesson of the ark itself. When I'm brought before God, if I've lived my life obedient to God's laws, if I've honored his priesthood and feasted on his bread, then his mercy will cover me and I will be worthy to live in his presence for eternity. Can you see how the tabernacle was a house of learning? A school? A place of divine education? It taught them, and it teaches us, how to return to God's presence. So our truth, the temple, like the ancient tabernacle, is a sacred place that teaches us, through symbols, a pattern for returning to our Heavenly Father. If I worship there often, then I will learn how I need to act and what I need to do to return to his presence. And to liken the scriptures, when and in what ways has the temple helped you to feel closer to God? And which of the pieces of furniture do you need to focus on most in your own personal journey towards God right now? Do you need to sacrifice more of your means, time, talents, and service or will to God? Do you need to purify yourself through sincere repentance? Do you need to pray more sincerely and often? Do you need to gain a greater understanding and ability to recognize and follow the promptings of the Spirit? Do you need to come closer to Christ and partake of His love and gospel? Or do you need God's mercy more in your life by being obedient, honoring the priesthood, and feasting on the manna of God's Word? Well, just as the tabernacle taught the children of Israel how to return to God, our modern-day temples do the same thing. I'm sure that if you've been to the temple that you can see some obvious parallels between the temple worship of the ancient tabernacle and temple worship today. It's not exactly the same, but similar. What is our Holy of Holies? The celestial room. 
and the focus of all temple ceremonies points us and leads to that room. Studying the symbolism of the ancient tabernacle can help prepare us to interpret the symbolism of the modern temple. Remember that everything you see and do and say within the temple is meant to teach you. It's not just ceremony or ritual or tradition. It's school. I like something that my father says about temple worship. He refers to it as sacred play. Like children might dress up like doctors or firemen or pretend to be parents to their dolls. They're imagining what it would be like to take on those roles. It's practice. Well, in a way, God invites us to his house and he says, let's play plan of salvation or return to my presence. Everything in his house points to that purpose. So when we worship there, we should be constantly asking ourselves questions. What does this teach me about returning to my heavenly parents and the celestial kingdom? Why am I dressed like this? Why is that scripture story being depicted? Why am I doing this particular thing? Why am I making that covenant? Why does the room look like this? Who does that represent? There are so many questions that we can ask. The temple can teach us every time we go. I pray that our study of the ancient tabernacle will help us to make those connections in our modern day temple worship. Now, there's another aspect of tabernacle worship in these chapters that I feel merits our time and attention. And as an icebreaker, I like to tell the following story. Once there was a certain college professor who seemed to find great satisfaction in mocking anyone who professed to believe in God. As a staunch atheist, it seemed like he took every opportunity to call into question the existence of a divine power. So one day, as he stood in front of the class, he decided that he was going to issue a challenge to the stubborn believers of God in his class. He sat on his stool at the front of the class and said, Okay, if there really is a God, may he prove his existence by knocking me off my stool here. And then he began to taunt and say things like, Okay, God, I'm here. Come knock me off my stool. If you really exist, I'm waiting. Well, it just so happened that at that moment, a football player was walking by the classroom and he heard the professor's comments and his taunting. Now, this football player just happened to be a believer, a believer in God. And so he ran into the room and tackled the professor off of his stool. Now, when the stunned professor stood up and demanded an explanation, the football player bluntly answered, well, God couldn't be here right now, so he sent me. Well, I love that probably fictional story as an introduction to the idea of priesthood power. It's a pretty good way of summing up the purpose and rationale behind priesthood. God couldn't be here personally to do all things, to do all the work that he needs to accomplish. So he sends us. He allows his children, his disciples, to represent him and grants them a measure of his very own power. And in the ancient tabernacle, God called priests to bear that priesthood power and perform the ordinances of the temple. These priests were all from the tribe of Levi. And then there was a high priest called, and Aaron was the first. And the high priest had a unique role in temple worship and wore special clothing that symbolized the purpose and power of the priesthood. Well, that clothing can also teach us a lot about the same priesthood that exists among us today. So let's examine that clothing together in Exodus chapter 28 and see what it can teach us about the priesthood. First, let's read Exodus 28 verses 1 through 3 together. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Arad, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. 
So my first question, why do you think the Lord had the priests wear different or special clothing? Why couldn't they just be dressed normally like everybody else in the camp? Is there something suggested by that? I think so. Bearers of the holy priesthood should be different. They should stand out. Priesthood holders should not be like your average individual. They hold themselves to a higher standard. In my ordination interviews with the young men of my ward, I'll often remind them of this, that they should be different than your average 12-year-old, 14-year-old, or 16-year-old boy. They are 12-year-old priesthood holders, or or 16-year-old priesthood holders. They're not expected to be perfect, but the bar is raised for them. They're to stand out and be different. And what were the three words used to describe the clothing that Aaron would wear? In verse 2, the words are holy, glory, and beauty. What did the priest's clothing just teach us about the priesthood? The priesthood is holy, glorious, and beautiful. The work it accomplishes is holy work. It's glorious work. It's beautiful work. Now, there are four parts of the clothing that we're going to focus on here. We're going to talk about the robe, the ephod, or a kind of apron that was worn over the robe, the breastplate of judgment, and the mitre, or the cap. And I have a handout here that depicts what that clothing may have looked like. Now, number your students off as ones, twos, threes, or fours, and then have them study their assigned scripture references that describe their assigned piece of clothing. Then see if they can match its meaning up with one of the possible interpretations that's given in the box below. And they can write the letter of that interpretation in the box next to their piece of clothing. Now be sure to let them know that they aren't required to choose one of those provided meanings. But they're encouraged to come up with some of their own and write those in the box. The symbolic meanings that I've come up with are not the definitive interpretations for each one. They're just my thoughts and ponderings. Other interpretations are possible. I mean, that's the beauty of symbolism, right? The symbols can mean different things to different people at different times. And after they've had sufficient time to study, you can come together after and discuss what the clothing taught them about the priesthood. But let's go ahead and examine each of these pieces together, starting with the ephod. So what materials was it made of? Gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen. All of these colors and materials were precious things. The priesthood is precious and of great worth. And of particular note, purple was a color of royalty. The dye to create the color purple was particularly rare, difficult to obtain. And therefore, only the very rich and the powerful had it available to them. The priesthood, then, is a royal priesthood priesthood from the king of kings. And then there were two onyx stones that were placed upon the shoulders of the priest. And the names of six of the tribes of Israel were on one stone, and the names of the other six on the other. Hmm, what What could the symbolism be here? Onyx stones are precious and rare. Priesthood bearers should view those that they serve as precious, rare, and special. And then look at verse 12. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Having something placed on your shoulders suggests responsibility. What is the responsibility of the priesthood? To help the members of the church to come to the presence of God. To bear them on their shoulders, so to speak, and help them come closer. I know the breastplate. This is really fascinating. It was also called the breastplate of judgment. Sometimes the priesthood bears the responsibility of judging the worthiness of the members of the church. As a bishop, I understand all too well the significance of that title. The breastplate was four square, a perfect square in shape. Why? The square suggested exactness. How should a bearer of the holy priesthood act? They should obey with exactness. They should be true and strive to walk the straight and narrow path. 
And then each tribe was represented by a gemstone, their names engraved on the bottom of each. Once again, what's being communicated about the children of Israel? They're precious, individually precious, each one. Different, unique, having their own special qualities and gifts, but equally of great worth. Then take a look at verse 29. Where was the breastplate worn? And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. So their names were worn close to his heart. How should the priesthood leader feel about those they serve? They love them deeply and carry them close to their hearts. And then what was placed inside the breastplate, according to verse 30? The Urim and Thummim, suggesting that the priesthood brings revelation and wisdom with it. Now the robe. Verse 32 tells us that the robe was created by weaving it from the neck hole top down so that it would have no seams or that it could not be rent. And this could suggest union, completeness, or no divisions within the priesthood. We should be united as a people under the priesthood. In verse 33, we're told that little pomegranate shapes were attached to the hem of the robe. Why pomegranates? Pomegranates are a unique fruit, aren't they? What's interesting about them? They're full of seeds, hundreds of seeds. And this could suggest that the priesthood is a fruitful priesthood, capable of producing much seed and future growth. And then also on the hem, little bells. And I'm not so sure about this one, but it tells us in verse 35 that when Aaron goes into the holy place, that his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. Well, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, the Lord doesn't like to be surprised. But maybe it's reinforcing the idea of standing out or being easily recognizable as a bearer of the priesthood. Or is it communicating the idea of being unashamed of the gospel of Christ, bold in sharing the message of the gospel, ready to be heard? Or perhaps there's a musical quality to it. There is harmony associated with the priesthood. Now, the mitre. Now, on the mitre, there was a gold plate with the following words engraved upon it. Holiness to the Lord. Now, where else have you seen that phrase written? On our temples. Priesthood bearers should also consider their bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. They should always have respect and reverence to the Lord. Why on the forehead? Because respect and dedication to God is to always be at the forefront of their thoughts. Gosh, don't you just love symbolism? It's really, really fun to just let the Spirit teach you through your own sense of imagination and creativity. I love this kind of stuff. Well, the like in the Scriptures. Well, in the past, priesthood holders would often have an interview called a PPI with their quorum leader or, or a personal priesthood interview. To liken the scriptures with this section, perhaps we can take our own little PPI with the lessons of the high priest's clothing in mind. Allow your students to ponder the following questions quietly to themselves. Are you different from those who don't bear the priesthood? Is the power of the priesthood precious to you? If so, how do you show it? Are you shouldering the responsibility to help others to be worthy to enter the presence of God? Do you view those you serve as precious and keep them close to your heart? Do you seek to obey the commandments with exactness? Do you seek revelation and know how to recognize the promptings of the Spirit? Do you seek for unity with other priesthood bearers and believers? Have you seen the fruits of the priesthood in your life? Name a few. Do you sound the call of the gospel for everyone to hear? Do you treat your body as a temple? Is holiness always at the forefront of your thoughts? Well, I bear witness that the power of the priesthood is real. 
I've seen what it can do. I've had the privilege to be blessed by it and the privilege of blessing others with it. I'm so grateful that our Heavenly Father is a God that has provided us with a framework of authority to work under and in and with. It's an amazing and sobering thought to think that God is willing to trust us enough to take on a portion of his incredible power and authority. God couldn't be here personally to accomplish all his works and purposes. So he sent us. And may we ever be clothed with the principles of the priesthood. Now, before we conclude our study of the book of Exodus, there's one more temple symbol that I wanted to share with you. There was a daily miracle at the tabernacle that I feel can teach us something important. What was that miracle in Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38? Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So there was always a column of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night hovering over the tabernacle. And what do you think that suggests? Well, let me ask you something. If you drove by somebody's home at night and saw all the lights on, or you walked by during the day and you saw smoke was coming out of the chimney, what would you assume about that household? You would assume that somebody was there that somebody was home. And what does that teach us about the temple? Who's always there? Who is home? The Lord. His presence is always there, ready to welcome us. And just imagine how that would make you feel during the days of the Israelites. As you were doing your work or or conducting your affairs, you might glance over at the center of the camp and see that beautiful column of smoke ever rising up to heaven. How comforting that must have been to see at all times and know that God was with you. Or at night, let's say you couldn't get to sleep, or you had to wake up early to do some work, and as you came to the door of your tent, you'd see that warm glow and the light of that pillar of fire burning above the tabernacle. And how comforting would that be? Perhaps you could feel its warmth and see by its gentle glow where you were going or what you were doing. That's the same kind of feelings that I get when I drive past the temple or see it lit up across the valley from my window. God's there. He's home. He's with us. Another principle taught here. What would that cloud of smoke or pillar of fire sometimes do? It would move. And what were the children of Israel supposed to do at that point? Follow it. Follow it whenever and wherever it went. Perhaps it would move in the middle of the night, or right at dinner time, or when you were comfortable, or right in the middle of a task. And what would you do? Drop everything, pick up camp, and follow. And sometimes the pillar would remain in a certain location for long periods of time, weeks or months or even years, and other times it could just be hours or days. You never knew exactly when the pillar might move. Well, what do you think the pillar of smoke and fire symbolizes for us? What fire are we to follow at all times and under any circumstances? It's the Spirit. It's the Holy Ghost. Whenever we're moved upon by the Holy Ghost, we are to follow it. Those promptings may not always come at the most convenient times or when we want them to. But when they do, we need to follow. A great illustration of the importance of following the promptings of the Spirit comes from the life of President Thomas S. Monson. You could show your class the following film clip and discuss how this story relates to the moving of the pillar of fire for the Israelites. And I'll provide links here in the description below and above. Well, we too must learn to follow the pillar wherever and whenever it moves.
Now, I'm not going to spend as much time with the Leviticus chapters, I'm afraid. It can be quite difficult for the modern reader to plow through the seemingly endless and strange religious, economic, dietary, and health practices of the early Israelites. Remember that the law of Moses was a law of carnal commandments, outward ordinances, and very strict and specific laws and regulations. Still, the fundamental principles that the law of Moses were based on are just as relevant to us as to them. And it's those fundamental principles that I wish to focus on here. The way I'd like to approach this with you is with an activity. You may remember Gordon B. Hinckley and his six B's for righteous living. It actually later became nine. Do you remember what they were, those six B's? Be grateful, be smart, be clean, be true, be humble, be prayerful. Well, I'd like to introduce you to the four B's of Leviticus and a blessing that they provide. And this is a letter tiles activity. And what you're going to do is you're going to try to figure out which letter tiles fit into the blank squares to form the word that represents the B statement from Leviticus. All of the tiles are going to be used just once in the activity. And to help you discover what those words are, I've provided you with a set of three verses or references to study that should help you to determine what the word is. So here we go. From chapter 5, 2 through 3, 721, and the chapter heading for chapter 11, the answer is be clean. Cleanliness and purity were of the utmost importance in the law and probably the most common message in the whole book of Leviticus. There were certain things, foods, practices, or events that could make you unclean. Now, this didn't automatically make you a social pariah, but there were specific instructions and purification rituals you had to undertake in order to become clean once again. Whether it was dietary restrictions, their health code, or laws of sexual purity, the Lord was sending a straightforward message about how they were to live their lives. Cleanly. Does this principle still apply to us today? Yes, we too have been given specific commandments and standards to help us to be clean. Like the word of wisdom, some things we can eat or drink are considered clean and some things are not. The media we consume, we should always ask ourselves if it is clean. The language we use, our thoughts, our motives. Are we striving to keep ourselves clean from the stains and filth of the world. The next B, from 1147, 20 verses 24 through 26, and 22, 2. The answer, B, different. I could have also chosen the word separate to complete that statement. By giving them laws that set apart certain things or foods or practices as clean or unclean, God was reminding them that they were to be a different kind of people, a separate nation. They weren't to be like everybody else. Does that principle still apply to us today? Yes, we too are meant to be different. The laws and standards that God has given us help us to stand out and be in the world, but not of the world. Next, from 1918, 1934, and 2535. B. Loving. The Mosaic Law had a lot to say about how the people were to treat each other, and even strangers. This is where we first see the command to love thy neighbor as thyself. I think sometimes that we make the mistake of thinking that the Law of Moses was all about retaliation. And we quote, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But right there in 1918, we see the command to not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. And unfortunately, the manual skipped those chapters back in Exodus that covered the fundamentals of the Mosaic Law. It was a law of restitution, not retaliation. And that's the spirit of the phrase, an eye for an eye. It's not, you hit me in the eye, so now I can get you and hit you back. It was, you did something that damaged something of mine or hurt me. 
Now you're obliged to restore that which was lost or make some sort of restitution to make up for it. The Lord wanted the Israelites to be loving and kind people. And does that principle still apply to us today? Yes, we too should be good neighbors. We are to treat all with kindness, courtesy, and love, regardless of race, gender, political party, culture, religion, or way of life. We are to love all as ourselves. One more. And this is a major focus of the entire book. I could have chosen so many different verses to point you to here, but I narrowed it down to just three. Chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 9, verse 4, and 17, 5. And the answer, be willing to sacrifice. Many of the chapters you read in Leviticus revolve around the practice of offering sacrifices to God. Now, is that because God loves dead animals? No, there were actually a number of different purposes for animal sacrifice. He was teaching them the power of giving things to God. When we give up something for God, he's able to bless us even more in the end. It was a way for them to offer thanks to God for all that he'd given them. Offering a sacrifice was an act of worship, thanks, or a recognition of God's goodness and provision. It also taught them the idea of justice and mercy. Sometimes, animals were sacrificed for the sins of the people. The animal would, in a way, take upon itself their sins. And in this way, the Lord was able to be just, in that the sin was being paid for in some way, while still being merciful to the person offering the sacrifice and allowing the animal to take their place. These sacrifices pointed them to Christ. Jesus Christ would one day become the Lamb of God, sacrificed for the sins of all. And it was done in similitude of God's only begotten. Does that principle still apply to us today? Yes, we too are asked to sacrifice things for God. Our time, talents, efforts, means, and will. Then, one more key word to focus on from Leviticus. It's not a bee but a promise for living the bees. This word comes up over and over and over again in Leviticus. You don't need to look up each one, but just take a look at this list. With a little time in the future, you may want to go through and mark every time you see this word, but, but what is it? What is the great promise of living the bees? Answer, atonement. The book of Leviticus teaches us the merciful principle of atonement. If the children of Israel committed themselves to living these principles, these bees, then an atonement would be made for them. And does this principle still apply to us today? Yes, the promise still applies. The truth, if we commit ourselves to living these same four bees, be clean, be separate, be loving, be willing to sacrifice, then the atonement of Jesus Christ will save us as well. See, I told you that the book of Leviticus wasn't irrelevant. God's fundamental principles don't change. The specific ways those principles have been applied have shifted over the years, but the spirit of them is the same. So I pray that we can live God's instructions as specifically and diligently as the ancient Israelites endeavored to do. And that's all the time we have for these chapters today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you are interested in any of the resources that I put together for teachers, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. If you found the video helpful, please share it with somebody that you feel it could help. A family member, or through social media, or by word of mouth. I would greatly appreciate that. You could also hit the like button, subscribe, or make a comment. All of those things help the channel to grow. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.